No Country for Old Men's genius is its ability to express great truths without words. It's a story that is hard to define, being a blend of drama, crime, thriller, and perhaps even elements of horror. Its ambiguity transcends traditional categorization. Reading this story, we're embedded in a dog-eat-dog -dog world of senseless violence and cruelty, leaving us in a state of despair with far more questions than answers. Underneath this maelstrom of chaos, however, is a cohesive and fine-tuned argument from McCarthy about the necessity for tradition, more morality and hierarchy in a new world that is ever increasing with violence, chaos, and young men believing themselves to be their own gods. And we'll break this down today. And as two quick heads up, there will be spoilers involved, and also I'll be referencing the book version of No Country for Old Men, even though I'll be showing clips from the actual movie itself. Now let's jump in. No Country is ultimately a battle of two forces. The old versus the new. Tradition versus radical freedom. Order versus chaos. Sheriff Bell represents the old. He's a man of the law, and he values values traditional values of order, justice, and morality. Now an old man and a World War II veteran, he possesses a fatherly and comfortable paternal spirit, sort of like a grandfather sitting on his rocking chair telling you about back in my day. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Anton Chigurh, who represents the new. He is a hitman and a man of chaos. Chigurh values nothing but his own subjective ethics, and is ultimately a man of bottomless cruelty because of his belief in fate and destiny. He therefore wholeheartedly rejects tradition, and order, justice, and morality. Man is his own maker, Chigurh believes, and those who are right in his eyes are those who are powerful. The third main character, Lewin Moss, who we won't get too deep into today, acts as an intermediary between the old and the new. He's a Vietnam veteran and often oscillates in between selfishness and morality. He succumbs in moments of weakness to fulfill his own sense of pride and greed, but he also proves himself to be remarkably humane, loyal, and bold when put under pressure. He's also the one that creates the action in the story, having stolen the initial drug money that sends Chigurh and the cartel after him, while Sheriff Bell, on the other hand, is desperately trying to save Lewin Moss and bring the cartel to justice. And thus, in between these three characters is a question of drama and fate. Will Lewin Moss survive? Will Chigurh track him down and retrieve the drug money? Can Sheriff Bell keep up with the chaos, viciousness, and evil of the cartel? And underneath this plot is just a mere battling of philosophies. Does truth, justice, and morality morality actually exist? And even if it does exist, can it stand up to the forces of evil who reject them altogether? And perhaps most importantly, how can we be good if we live in a world that seems to be run by those who deny the existence of justice and morality altogether? Can it be as simple as might is right and that's it? These are the philosophical questions and stakes that are established within No Country for Old Men's plot. And we can look at the stakes deeper now by closely analyzing both Chigurh and Bell. As we already established, Chigurh is a ruthless hitman who denies justice, morality, and order. He lives by his own code, possessing this ambiguous, almost contradictory view of human nature, as he believes in destiny, but he also seems to believe that people have the power of choice. Namely, it's the choices that people make that put them on these certain unwavering paths that lead them to their ultimate and final destiny. Hence, Sugar sees himself both as the creator of his own life, the master of himself, yet at the same time, he believes that he's not actually responsible for his actions and his murders, instead believing that he's merely an instrument of destiny, serving the fate of victims who are suffering the consequences of their actions. It's the fact that Chigurh is a walking contradiction that makes him so powerful. Someone like Sheriff Bell, who is guided by morality and tradition, is a largely predictable character. Chigurh, by contrast, has no restraint. He can move how he likes and do what he wants and seemingly suffer no consequences. This therefore makes Sugar a powerful representation of the new way of being. Truth, morality, and objectivity don't seem to exist. Because Shigur, who rejects these ideas, seems to murder everyone and largely succeed in his ambitions and motivations throughout the story. Hence, Shigur is a fantastic argument in some sense that yes, perhaps we should just be masters of ourselves and reject a higher order and reject morality and reject truth. Instead, let's create our own ethics and enforce our will on others, as this is how we get our way in life. And it's the very fact that Shigur succeeds throughout the story that makes No Country for old man so disturbing, because there are no clear-cut answers to address this powerful argument. There doesn't seem to be anyone who can stand up to Chigurh, and it doesn't get much better when we look on the other side of the coin. No Country for
for Old Men actually gets more tragic as we dig deeper and deeper into the story of Sheriff Bell. He is simply a man who is searching for redemption through the pursuit of justice. He's haunted from his time during World War II as he fled from a German ambush and was the sole survivor in his platoon as his men and brothers in arms died. And while we're told that there's nothing Bell could have done to actually save his brothers, he still feels forever guilty about abandoning them, I guess having a sense of survivor's guilt. Thus, he chastises himself as a coward and initially becomes a sheriff to try to pursue justice and protect others in hopes to make up for the wrongs that he supposedly did during the war. To Bell, success is simply being able to uphold order, morality, and justice and protect the weak and protect the innocent. He fails at this. Chigurh and the cartel prove themselves to be too strong and too fast and too swift. They're not constrained by the law, nor morality, nor any sense of order like Bell is. And thus, the entire story essentially shows Sheriff Bell hopelessly and slowly five steps behind the villains that he is desperately trying to capture. He fails to save Lewin Moss, fails to save Carla Jean, fails to stop the cartel, and fails to capture Chigurh. And ultimately, he retires from the police force in shame. Disillusioned by the realization that the cartel is either too strong, or he is too old, or too weak. Lamenting that there's no place in a country for old men like himself. The tragedy here is, Bell's greatest failure actually has nothing to do with stopping Sugar or the cartel. Realistically, there's probably no one in his position who could have stopped them. His biggest failure was actually his failure to forgive himself. It's doubtful that he did anything objectively wrong when he fled the Germans in the war, and whether or not he was wrong to flee, this doesn't change the fact that he is a good and noble man, and doesn't deserve the punishment he put himself through all these decades. He created this unfair playing field in that he needed to be redeemed, and in his eyes, the only way he could be redeemed was to do something that no human could do, which is essentially to protect all the innocent people from all the evil people. There is a strong implication that he's probably a Christian, and you could say his greatest flaw is his savior complex, that he feels he should be his own sort of messiah, that it's his duty to save his fellow man. As an officer of the law, he can certainly serve and protect and do that well, but the reality is even doing that job well doesn't mean you'll always succeed in stopping murders from happening. Thus, Bell's greatest failure is not his failure to stop the cartel, his failure was allowing himself to believe that he was a coward and a wicked man, and essentially allowing himself to give up the fight for justice altogether. The hidden message of No Country for Old Men is that the actual meaning of life is within the fight for goodness itself. Even though Bell failed to stop the cartel, he was still a consistent source of comfort and stability for the reader. He was still a source of goodness. And perhaps he was the only source of goodness. And what the society of No Country for Old Men needs isn't necessarily more strong men, but more good men who are strong. Bell's goodness doesn't come from the fact that he was a sheriff who was successful. His goodness came from his heart, from his morality, from his desire to do good to others. And it's his very effort and fight and struggle against evil that is what we most ought to study and consider. That we should follow his example for the first 90% of the plot. To recognize that the fight for goodness is worthwhile even if we're losing the fight. Just because a battle isn't winnable doesn't mean it's not worth fighting. And it's far superior to fail at being a sheriff like Bell than it is to succeed at being an Anton Chigurh. Thus, despite the very despairing, bleak, and dark tone of No Country for Old Men, there is a genuine silver lining to the story. And I'd hate to end on a cliche here, but that silver lining is simply the fact that it doesn't matter how hard we get hit in the fight, it only matters that we get back up and keep fighting for the good. To recognize that that is the best path forward in life. Thank you so much for watching, my friend, and take care.